but the folks that don't want other folks to enter that industry, you know, we need a new generation of mm -hmm. riders. We need a new pe generation of people that are in, uh, excited about gigantic adventure bikes, right? And it's like, are you contributing to the hive or are you gatekeeping, trying to keep people out, yeah. right? And, and what is it you think you are gaining by keeping people out? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't understand people who do it to begin with. Hey guys, my name is Phil and I'm the host of The Phil Experience. Today's episode is the reason, the absolute reason why, number one, I renamed it The Phil Experience, and number two, why I'm so excited to bring you this video and of course, audio podcast. Today's guest is the sales manager of Foothills BMW Triumph in Lakewood, Colorado, Brendan Wood. He's not only a motorcycle enthusiast, but he has had an amazing life, and that's what we dig into. That's why it's called the Phil Experience, because we can talk about motorcycles, we can talk about the standard, tell me about your first motorcycle, right? The standard boring stuff, or we can talk about your life, your history, what have you done? Brandon's done incredible stuff, and that's what we dig into. Of course, we talk about motorcycles, but to me, the compelling part, the part that I really like to dig into with all the guests is about their lives, about their take on life, about their outlook, about their experiences. That's what makes this an experience. And that's what sets this show up for success. And also you as the watcher and listener for an amazing experience. Two things before we get the episode started. Number one, I filmed this on site at Foothills and they have a, a ceiling window, which if you're watching this on video, it's gonna be hilarious. You're gonna see the sunlight start to, start to creep across the set. It actually starts to blind me for a little bit, but hey, just some of the challenges we face as we learn and we produce better and better content. So I thought that was kind of funny, wanted to share it with you. The second thing is um, even more funny. I have always gotten Brendan's last name wrong. Ever since we started filming a, an episode together about the BMW R1300, I've seen him several times and I've always called him by the wrong last name. So I did it in the intro to this episode and we laugh about it and we move on, but I wanna leave that in there because hey, you're getting authentic, you're getting vulnerable, you're getting Phil even making mistakes. It's all good. So final thought before we get started, first half of the episode, we talk about Britain's amazing life and his experiences, which frame up the second half of the episode. We get into sales and motorcycles and all the good stuff. So guys, from me to you, please enjoy this episode. Your support in this endeavor means more to me than you could know. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Here we go. And you know, I, I mean, all mics are going to be different. Oh, maybe a little bit lower. A little bit lower? It's a move right in front of it. Yeah. yeah. They, oh, that's good. That's good. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, every mic's different. Yeah. So. Yeah. I love these, man. These are, I, I went through the evolution of like, uh, start with this mic. It's like a hundred mm -hmm. bucks. Then you start with that mic and you start with it. Or I think I started with a condenser. Then I went dynamic. Then I went this other one. Then I went these, you know what I mean? You yep. always get like a different tone. I started with a USB Yeti mic. Mm. When I was just like, you know what, let me see if I can get anywhere with this. That's what I started with, the yep. Blue Yeti? Yeah. The big, like, Jay um, Leno looking thing? <laughs> yeah, that old throwback. I'm like, yeah. man, that looks cool. That looks like what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, but, you know, not knowing any different, having, not knowing what I had used in a sound booth previously. Yeah. Um, and compared to, um, like, the, the mics I would use for different events, handhelds, mm -hmm. worlds apart, like, I like to pretend I knew what I was doing, but I was like, it's a mic, right? It's just yeah. a, no, such a world apart. I'm learning. I'm still learning. And mm -hmm. like with this setup and I, and I consume a ton of content on YouTube and, uh, but like with this setup, like, um, not only just like optimizing the mic and, but stuff like auto, is it sound gates? Mm -hmm. So when I stop talking, it stops picking up and then that way you can talk and just all the things that give audio, like the quality it has. I, a long time ago, excuse me, I, um, now, you can have kind of an okay video, but if your audio is shit, people aren't going to watch it. No, it doesn't matter. No, yeah. it's it could be the best visually mm. that you could put together that anybody could put together. But if um, I was listening to, I'm a bit of a nerd, and when I ride or when I do anything, really, I'll listen to books on tape or Audible, not even on tape anymore, or um, news, and especially when I ride because I will ride at the pace of whatever I'm listening to. Mm. <laughs> so put a little speed metal on there. Yeah. I, I have <laughs> I have been caught. Yeah, and, and yeah. it's inadvertent. But anyway, get back to it. Um, like in that quality of sound, like people coming through, and you hear those sharp S's that are like whistling and things like yeah. that, or like like is that guy drinking as he's talking? Like yeah, the the quality really does go a long way. It can ruin everything, and once that's in your head, it just mm. throws it off. So I get that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm going to leave most of this in here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Brendan Hall. Welcome to the show, man. Brendan Wood. Brendan Wood. That's all right. I don't even know your last name. <laughs> Brendan. Uh, let's see. This time it was Hall. In the first one, it was, uh, what was it? Brendan Fraser. <laughs> Brendan Fraser. Dude, so I watched that over and over again. I was dying. That's why I left it in there. And uh, Brendan Wood. I uh, I don't know where I got Hall from. But I, because, uh, uh, you know, you were coaching me. You're like, it's like Brendan Fraser. It's yeah, like Brendan. that was right before we started recording. And so I'm like, okay, everything's live. And I'm like, I'm, I was like half paying attention to you. All right, everybody, <laughs> we got Brendan Fraser. Welcome like, to the show. And in my head... I was like, what the Like, hell? is he playing with me? I'm like, I was waiting. That's exactly what I thought. I was like, I want to, what? All right, just keep rolling. All right. Just keep rolling. Just yeah, and it's and if you watch it happen live, well, it's not live, but it's recorded. It's like, it's actually funny because you, you can see I am totally locked in. Uh -huh. We have Brendan Frazier on the show, and you're just like, what? what is happening? <laughs> All right, maybe he's serious. And, and instantly, I'm like, no, he just, it, it was so quick after we had actually done that, mm -hmm. and, like just trying to assimilate it. And And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, I'm 45. Growing yeah. up in the 80s, you wanted a license plate for your bike. Uh -huh. Brendan was never an option. It was always Brandon or or some variant. So I got used to being called whatever. Yeah, <laughs> like if yeah. it's close, I know you're talking to me. Well, I I owe you a proper proper introduction. <laughs> so everybody, Brendan Wood. That's me. Welcome to the show. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> the man, the myth. There he is. Look, uh, I know you've got a uh, or had a career. So first of all, yep. Once you introduce yourself uh, and and why are you on this uh, show right now? You know, we're sitting in a motorcycle dealership. Dealership. Uh, what do you do here? We are. We are in Foothills BMW Triumph. Uh, I am the sales manager here. Um, why I'm on the show? I'm going to go with dumb luck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I right know. Place, I know right exactly time. why you're in the show because when, <laughs> when we we shot the the sequence on riding the 1300 mm -hmm. and then we had the BDR screening and I talked to you a little bit just trying to get to know you and I was like this dude's an interesting dude well I appreciate that and I think that uh I know that that is why um I've had interest in the podcast and I've had interest in because it's like uh, I'm the big Joe Rogan fan right mm -hmm. I look at this guy like he's at the pinnacle right yeah and it's almost like if I ride a motorcycle and I look at a MotoGP race like that guy and so I try to emulate a, bit, a little bit and uh you know one of his things is like I just have very interesting people on and I, I, I try to, to dovetail on that, and it's like, I want, bonus, you know, you're in the motorcycle industry. But, dude, you've had an interesting life, you've got interesting stories. Uh, and I think that's why, I know that's why you're on, and, and I'm excited to have you, man. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's one of those things, like, if you sit down and talk to someone, they could always have just an interesting life. But to them, that's just life. That's just what I like, did. That's that's what happened to me, or that's... And I hate to say like what happened to me, but you know that's that's how my life played out. Mm. That's the path I chose, whether consciously or subconsciously. You know, it sort of it all leads us here. Yeah, you know, I, I had a planned sort of way I wanted to start this off, but kind of talking about audio equipment and you know we've got these microphones, and you're you're no stranger to that. So I think one of the interesting things that you were, you were, you kind of alluded to a little bit, but you used to do like. Big time announcing was it like for monster trucks or what were you what were you what were you announcing for? Um, so I announced for Kicker Arena Cross for a season. Arena and Cross, then, um, the Kicker series was so much fun. It was all over. Well, the section I did was the Western U.S. Um, just had a blast doing it. Uh, the owner of it was great. You know, they decided to go a different direction afterwards. I couldn't always be at every race because I was still working here in mm. Denver as well. So I had to juggle those two things and. You know, and through no fault of my own or, or anything with them, it, it just didn't go into another season, and that's okay. It was still an amazing experience, and uh, I wouldn't change it for anything. Uh, again, it's just things happen, and I had actually started doing something called Doc Dogs, which was, um, people might know it, but not know what the name of it is. Um, it's that competition where dogs are, like, firing off a dock for distance. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah so, very cool. Again, dumb lucked my way into that, just knowing people and not even realizing I knew these people. And this is when I was living in Chicago, and uh, it just sort of snowballed. It's, one thing leads to another in that industry. Mm. It's very small. Um, there's still some goals I have set for it, but you know those I'll have to have work you ever, themselves out. Have you ever thought, and I wanted to ask about the industry a little bit, but have you ever thought of doing like audio books or like, there because i mean you kind of got the james earl jones thing going on um i've actually done two audiobooks one nice. of which is still available on audible um it 
was a strange experience. It's um, anybody who's listened to them, you know, you sort of you sit down or, or in my case, driving to work, riding a bike, whatever, wherever you want to listen to them. And some people might, but most people aren't going to think about the process of being made. Um, yeah. It takes a lot more work than just sitting down and reading into a microphone. I mean, there's so many different things that can tweak it. I mean, like we were talking about microphones and things like that, you know, little things that you would not think get picked up. Mm. All of a sudden you're listening back to it and you hear a car go by, but you know, you didn't even hear a car go by while you were reading it. Um, there's all sorts of things doing it. Uh, I think, um, or I know in, in, in my journey through this, and you know, I, I do apply some um, some filters, right, to audio, go high and low pass, and you got the bands and and you know the the obviously the mixer here to ch try to give you the best audio quality. But I did dig into audiobook, um, and this is cool because I didn't know you did this. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you have. Oh, wait, this, you didn't? No, I thought I'd mentioned it. No, oh, no. See, I'm finding more about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm really, really yeah. good with that. No, but you got the soundproof booth, soundproof booth, but then all of the. Uh, the mixing and the quality that has to go into getting that audio perfect. And I, and I listen to audiobooks, and I, I try to pick up on, uh, okay, maybe he, you end a sentence and then you start a sentence, and it sounds a little bit different. It's like maybe that's when he took a break. Because it is probably more than just reading your script. Like, mm -hmm. hey, Do you do it like a paragraph at a time, or how does that work? So for the first book I did, um, that one was a little tricky because it was, um, and I can't remember the title, it was back in 2018, um, it was speeches and quotes from Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Okay. Malcolm was a little bit easier because not everyone knows his cadence. Not everyone oh. knows how he sounds. Mm -hmm. Um, Martin Luther King was tricky to say the least because I mean, we've all heard him. Yeah. We all know yeah. his cadence, his dialect, everything that goes into making his voice and his oratory skills, what they are, mm -hmm. was so tricky because I couldn't just read them in my voice and expect people to really take it as far as they could and, and, and take those messages that he was putting out how they were meant to be. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would take a portion of that, um, whether it be a quote or whatever I was reading for that part, and I would look it up and I would see if there was a video. I would see if there was an audio recording of it. And having gone to school for theater, I would. Dude, this interview just gets better and better. <laughs> it's, it's so far away from the industry <laughs> right now, but we're going to get into we're gonna it. We're going to get right into now. it. So theater, okay. But what I would do is I would take that and I would try to mimic it. And I knew I was never going to get it exactly as mm. he said it or anything else. But I didn't try to replicate the voice. I just tried to re replicate the speech patterns and um, his cadence because really that's all I could do with something that was that known. Um, I got that book on, when was that? That was Christmas Eve of 2017. Okay. I finished that book at the end of January 2018, um, all the editing and everything. And that one I actually paid someone else to do. Mm. I recorded the whole thing, sent it out, said I need it in three days. I paid a chunk for it to get it done and submitted it. And you know, it was online for about a year. Um, it comes back in like every few years, it'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got some mailbox money coming from that? You know, every once in a while. Nice, <laughs> nice. Every once in a while. Um, it was a great experience, um, but it really showed me how difficult that could be to do an audio book on your own. Um, still, it's something I love to do. I've got the setup at the house. I just uh, don't always have the time for it with the, uh, with mm. the family. I've got yeah. a daughter who will be two on April 8th. And then uh, here, yeah. I mean, anybody who works knows that you're at work. Yeah. It seems like most of your life. So it's hard to find that time and keep family going too. Audiobooks. So uh, it's almost like you're studying for a role. Now, if you, so I, I would listen to in the past a lot of like uh, Jack Ryan. And first of all, uh, Scott Brick is, a, is an amazing uh he, he narrates all those books. And I'm like, how does he do like all the range of voices, even women's voices? And he mm -hmm. makes you believe that you're listening to a woman. So I think that's a huge talent. But where I'm going with this is it's all like they're all like made up characters, yeah. right? Yeah. You are like reading a book and trying to emulate as best you can, you know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. So that has to be like you're studying. You have to study to try to get as best you can. It is one of the most intimidating and fun things that I have done. Mm. in that aspect of my life. Um, 
and again, because people know these people. Right. And I was fully, And we've seen them talk. Yeah. 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 And I was fully ready for, uh, I don't want to say the hate, but f- fully, fully ready for the criticism coming through of, you don't sound like this, or he didn't speak like that. Yeah. No kidding. Because I'm not them. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not about, it's not about me replicating their voices or anything like that. I tried to get as close as I could, but mm-hmm. it's just about getting, you know, their message out. There's a whole generation of people who haven't really, who know the names, have never really heard them. So it was cool to do, um, especially with my background. Um, it, it was fun. It was overwhelming, but I wouldn't have changed it. It did, but like I said, it did give me a look on the on the audiobook world. It was like, man, I'm not, I'm not ready to do all this editing and everything on my own. So, you know, if here and there they come up, and if it's a shorter book, I would still do them. But, I mean, that was finished product a little over an hour and a half. Okay. Oh, and, uh, of... If I listened to it, it would take an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. If you listen to it, and how long did that take you to make? Uh, the Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X part was about thirty hours. Wow. Yeah. And, so let's extrapolate that a little bit. The books I listened to, mean, you know, 10, 15 hours. So you're talking hundreds of hours. Hundreds of hours. Now those people also have studios mm. where they can go in and they can they have. And you've got your Yeti mic. <laughs> USB. <laughs> That's what I recorded it on, man. No That's what way. I recorded it on, yeah. So that, just so everybody understands, if you're watching or listening to this, <coughs> the USB Yeti mic is like the basement level starter mic, no enhancements. So if you were able to record an audio book on that, that is incredible. I mean, it's obviously your voice is amazing, but that's an incredible accomplishment. It was so much fun. Um, I didn't know what I didn't have. Yeah, So yeah. it was that thing of, hey, I'm going to get this. And it was so exciting to have a mic and know what I was working towards Mm -hmm. and getting into that I was so excited about. I didn't even care. And again, I didn't know what I didn't know. What did you, uh, what did you, what, uh, would you record to? Was it just like your audio on your windows computer? Just raw? uh, I was, I was going uh, straight into uh, audacity. Okay. Okay. And audacity works great for some things. Um, That is the equivalent of the Yeti mic. It's great for when you're first getting started. Right, so. right. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this, and, and it's interesting that the journey you go on uh, through this, through my own journey of, like, Blue Yeti mic, and then it's a USB, then it's a better USB, and then it's like, oh, I got to have XLRs and mixers. And, yeah. and But every time you do that, you level up, level yeah. up, level up. And I think that's, uh, that's a super cool experience. And the other part of it is almost all of this is out on YouTube, open source, where you're like, I want to learn how to do this thing. Yeah. Somebody, 10 people are going to teach it to you. It's very easy. Um, now you're also going to get 10 different opinions on it. Mm-hmm. So I think um, you have to be able to disseminate. There was something Elon Musk said about, man, Elon, I don't want to misquote you on this. I'll paraphrase, but it was like, why would you go to school? Obviously, you want your surgeon to go to school, but he's like, everything for free. Everything's free online. Yeah, he, the, he made that statement. I remember it, and, and again, I don't know the exact way he said it, but that does ring a bell. Yeah, you don't want your, uh, you don't want your neurosurgeon learning something from you, too. <laughs> Right. But, Although if there were videos on YouTube teaching neurosurgery, that'd be scary and weird at the same time. Yeah, I don't know if I want to be. <laughs> so I'm in my garage, know. guys. <laughs> Trust me, I'm sterile. It's this okay. is fine. This yeah. is fine. <laughs> I have this dead uh, uh, hawk that I found. And we're going to use it as a. Watch, if you push on this part of the brain, that nerve. Gets yeah. Back. You don't, you don't want to see your surgeon Mm-mm. doing that. How does one get into announcing is it knowing and knowing somebody and how does one get into reading audiobooks like is what's the path because it just seems so let me set this up yep. i actually was like oh let me check this out same thing blue yeti mic man my voice sounds good and i'm like uh, i could do this but you you go down this google path and it's almost like ambiguous you don't know and then there's like oh you can sign up on upwork or fiverr and it's like ah it's not really the thing mm-hmm. is it just because you knew somebody i didn't know i knew somebody okay and um a woman from my past, uh, we were high school friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, we crossed paths again in Chicago, and uh, we went to lunch. You know, we're just catching up. And she tells me about this doc dog thing, which I had mentioned earlier. Yeah. And she explained it a little bit more in depth. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And wait, you get to you get to travel around the country and just see different places? I'm like, oh, that's cool. Just on a whim, let me know if you ever need anything from me. I would mm-hmm. love to help. And then we moved on to a different part of the discussion. Man, I tell you what, about three days later, I get a call from her boss, and he doesn't know me from anyone. Okay. We start talking, and he asks me if I would like to announce um, the, of all places, to have a dog event 
the Chicago Boat Show. Okay. In February, in Chicago. Cold. Oh, yeah. And we were right next to one of the um, one of the service doors. Okay. In McCormick Center. And these dogs are jumping in some ice cold water, or what? Yeah, it's never heated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were going for it, and uh, it was the craziest thing I had ever witnessed. Like I'm watching this happen, but at the same time. The cracks in the door are letting snow blow through oh my God. because on the other side of that door is Lake Michigan, <laughs> and it is blowing. When they took the pool down that weekend when it was over, mm -hmm. they had to pour water, hot water, on the pool because ice had frozen the pool to the concrete. Oh. So that started what was about a two-year journey all around the country and um, announcing events for them, um, and that spiraled into announcing for the Muddy Buddy, which is like the grandfather, was the grandfather of the adventure races that you see now. Uh, this was a team-based race where one person's running, one person is on a bicycle, and there were obstacles. At each obstacle, you would swap. Like, obviously, the bike's going to get there first. Mm -hmm. You leave the bike, and then you start running. Your partner catches up, does the same obstacle, grabs the bike, passes you. So it's sort of like a leapfrog situation. Yeah. From there, that's where Kicker Arena Cross came in, and... Mm -hmm. You know, I thought it was rolling. I thought it was good. Like, this is the path I wanted to take. Like, yeah. This is where I wanted to be. I wanted to be able to be out in front of thousands of people entertaining them. And it was never, it's not like I thought that was going to bring me some sort of fame, but it was just like this great feeling of being able to entertain people and grab their attention. And a little bit of a narcissistic pull on it because it's like you have all these eyes on you. And, you know, I don't want to go into why, but maybe something deep buried in the childhood made me need that. Mm -hmm. And there it was. I mean, at one point we were in the Budweiser Event Center and there were over 6,000 people watching me announce a race in the dirt. And it was just such a cool feeling. Yeah. That it just, you know, one thing led to another. And then, you know, life happens. And, you know, I got passed over for a season and, Found other things to fill my time, and what's that's the? Where, uh, oh, yeah. uh, say what's the criteria before we get to that? Because I want to know, like, what do they look for, right? Because obviously, you got a great voice, and you probably know the the series very well. But let's get back to dogs jumping off docks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it like you had to do the research for Malcolm X? You had to do the research for. Do you like you know coming in at seventy six pounds? And two years old, here comes Blackie, right? Like, like you know, you... you're not too far off. Really? Uh, we didn't have weights on anything. Okay. But, you know, a dog would come up, you're, you've got this call sheet of the dog, the handler, um, some stats from the last time they competed mm. or, or the last time they did whatever, and some history on the dog. And you're entertaining a crowd. Yeah. And it is so overwhelming to have these like you you start watching the event as well and then there's these brief moments where you sort of shift focus and you're out and you look at this crowd and you realize they're paying attention to you yeah so the right kind you have to be the right kind of person for it not mm -hmm. everybody can just do it and then you know i've seen some people just sit behind a table and be very like westminster dog show <laughs> yeah, yeah. boring <laughs> westminster dog show right. um not to say that no, screw it. That's boring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, it's very like golf clappy. Yeah, yeah. it is. I think yeah. golf clapping might be more entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to engage people first and foremost. And if you can't do that, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Um, but then again, if it makes you happy, do what you want. But for this one, the biggest one for the dogs, the biggest thing I ever did event wise was at the time it was the um, Teva Mountain Games in Vail. Mm -hmm. Now it's the uh, GoPro Games literally covering a mountainside and i had a wireless mic and i'm like i'm gonna go for it yeah with a wireless i had about 150 foot radius around the uh the receiver so okay. i could go and just do my thing and it was so much fun to just walk around this pool and i had my call sheet and i had everything and just going for it trying to entertain the crowd and you know some jokes hit some don't mm-hmm some people get it, some people won't. It, it doesn't matter. But like in anything, even in what I do now, if you match the crowd's energy or go above and beyond the crowd's energy, they're going to follow you. Yeah. All right. You're going to keep them engaged. So it, it, what type of person does it take? Take somebody who's not afraid to be in front of a large group. And for me, it's weird. I can do very small groups, like a dozen or less, and I can do 
hundreds and thousands of people. Mm. But that middle ground of like 50 to like 75 yeah. people is so awkward for me. Uh -huh. It's so weird. I don't know what it is, but give me a small group or give me a giant arena and I can do it. It's so much fun. And I think, you know, imagine your favorite sport or whatever it is uh, with no commentary, no announcing. I mean, like when somebody scores a touchdown or, or you know, whatever the thing yep. is, and you've got the commentator just going ballistic or or Joe Rogan's announcing a fight or, oh, my God. You know, like it just, it, <laughs> that's, scene where you're like, yeah. that's where, you, you know, you come in and you really, you got the audience on a, on a yo-yo almost, right? Yeah. Like it's just, it has to be an amazing feeling. You're almost like a conductor. Like they're yeah. going to follow what you tell them to do. Mm. And it is just cool to do. I mean, and again, it's not for everybody, mm -hmm. but what is? Yeah. So, you know, it's just one of those paths I took. So. Yeah. And so you're really not into that anymore, right? The right opportunity, I would be back doing it in a moment. Um, I wouldn't leave what I do because those are just, those are weekend things. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the motorcycle industry more than I ever thought I would. So to have that secondary outlet, I would be gone in a minute. Ultimately, and my wife keeps pushing me to this, is uh, rodeo. Oh, a oh. little rodeo. Oh, love it. Yeah. Love it, the constant action of it. I mean, yeah, that's a good That would be me. cool. And like serious risk, serious danger. Oh, yeah. You're, you, you see things. So <laughs> I mean, you're not on the dirt for that one, thankfully. Yeah. So yeah. I don't yeah. need to be in between the uh, rodeo clown and a 2,000-pound bull. But I'll be up in the. Uh, That's the booth really above cool, it. and it's interesting. You're talking about it's a, and I guess it would be a smaller um, world than most people would think. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many announcers are there? And they probably all know each other. They really do. Um, I mean, I know guys who have announced everything from. Um, actually, a guy I went to high school with is the voice of the Bears, the Chicago oh. Bears, and uh, Back and the Bulls. So, you know, we went to high school together. And then um, he knows guys who've done other events that we just sort of circuitously have the same circle of people. And uh, it's pretty cool. I, every year when the rodeo comes through for the National Western, there's a guy, Boyd Palmas. He is like, he is the voice of rodeo. And, you know, this year my daughter got to meet him. Mm. She has no clue. I, it, was, right. it was for me. Let's be honest. It was for me. <laughs> can you take a picture of me? <laughs> yeah. Hand your daughter the phone. Like, no, no, no. You no, no, no. You, 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 you're two. You can hold the phone. Yeah, Get it right. Yeah. Get your life right. So. Oh man, that's crazy. I, it's super interesting. And, and to uh, continue on with the interesting, so we've done the announcing, the dog stuff. Uh, and I just, I really want to do this because it sets kind of the context of how you arrived to where you are now. Mm -hmm. uh, you used to be the guy bouncing, right? For 12 years, I was a, um, I was a bouncer in some way, shape or form in Chicago. Mm. And uh, Chicago, you know, I'm from a little small town just outside of Champaign, Illinois. I moved up to Chicago in 20, or no, I'm sorry, 20, uh, 1997, right out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, I had I, I didn't know what else to do. So I went to, I was like, what, what's a cool place that I can tell people in my little small town that it's cool to work? And I found the House of Blues. Mm -hmm. So for better part of a week, every day after I finished school, um, I would take the bus or walk up to the House of Blues and just sit and wait to talk to their uh, bar manager, or their uh, um, concert venue manager. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I'm in college. I have this kind of free time. This is what I want to do. And he's sort of like, all right, I'll talk to you a little bit. And then two, three hours go by, and I'm still sitting there waiting. <laughs> Done. Yeah. And uh, he's like, What's a little bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And uh, I was just waiting for him. And mm -hmm. I guess it was just the persistence and the dedication of sitting there. And bear in mind, this is before like smartphones, well before. I was yeah. just sitting there staring at walls, doing mm -hmm. nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, finally got brought on for that. And about two weeks in, I get an invite to go, <clears throat> pardon, to go to a little bar, and I'm not going to name the bar, uh, <laughs> across the way from them. Mm. Like, all right, I didn't think anything of it. Uh, I go in, order drinks with them. Everything's fine. Everything's golden. Another week or so goes by. I get invited to another bar. It's like some sort of mafia and, and test like, or something. You know, right? Yeah. Good think of it. And I was like, oh, I don't know anybody there. And this girl looks at me. She's like, why? It's like, I don't know if I can get in. 
I'm only 18. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I've been drinking yeah. with these guys for a month, um, working, and I didn't realize that to even be a bouncer, you had to be 21. So she pulled me to the side. She's like, don't tell anyone. Like, yeah. That's our secret. And a year and a half later, when I finally left, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not even 21 yet. But we didn't <laughs> leave on good terms. So... <laughs> And by the way, yeah, yeah. surprise, no surprise. Um, you know, I was in college, and it was it was weekend money. It wasn't a big deal to you know stay out until four in the morning working, mm -hmm. and I didn't have Saturday or Sunday classes, and which I don't think even had Monday classes. But I mean, that that snowballed. You know, my mom told me, you know, when you're in college, work in a bar, make some money. That way, you can still be in school. It snowballed, and one thing led to another, and you take those steps and. You know, next thing you know, you're in a different state, helping a buddy open a bar, help the guy in Hawaii open a bar. Um, in Hawaii? Yeah. <laughs> so, Dude. Well, he had, we had worked together in yeah. Chicago. And, okay. you know, things went right for him. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, he since sold it, but whatever. Um, things just snowball, man, I guess. And, and again, to me, this is just, this is the life I, you know, this is the path my life took. So it, yeah, yeah. Is it cool? Is it fun? Yeah, some parts, but some parts are really down, too. Yeah, I think you, I was talking to my buddy about this, uh, actually last night, and the lows make the highs even better. Yeah. I think you got to have that. Mm -hmm. you gotta Otherwise, you don't know their highs. Yeah. So If you could just choose to be, I don't know, not safe, but if I just could just live at 60% my whole life, I wonder how many people would take that. And it would be a tragedy because if you don't experience that low, mm -hmm. how do you know what the 100 feels like? Or the 110? Exactly. And imagine those people who live at 30. Yeah. To see you living at 60 and it's boring for you. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's just, we could always be somebody's inspiration. So yes, I think even if you don't think it's that ex exciting for yourself. Oh, dude! I mean, like, you know, <laughs> I think I read this thing t today in this book, and it was like the average, <sighs> the average income in the world is like five thousand bucks a year on average. Mm -hmm. So if you make more than five thousand dollars a year, you're in like the top ninety five percent. It's crazy, isn't it? Because we're so insulated here to think that we. Um, we have to make this certain amount of income. And, you know, to, to survive in this country, yeah, you do, and it's still a great mm -hmm. country. But when you really look at the grand scheme of things, yeah, yeah, there are definitely people who are in bad positions. But in the grand scheme of things, man, I've got a roof over my head. Yes. And you know, I've got food in the fridge. I can't be too upset. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything went right. Not everything went how I wanted it to. I'm sure it's happened for you oh, as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But we're still here. We're still pushing. We're still, we, we haven't given up. Yeah. So there's really nothing to look bad upon, and, you know, we're, we're here doing our thing. So speaking of being here doing your thing, that's what you're doing. So yeah. you've got the dogs announcing the audible <laughs> books, the uh, bouncing at the bars, and now you've landed, you know, you've been here for in the motorcycle industry for a number of years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you put it all out there like that in one, <laughs> one, in one statement. Do people even like know who they're dealing crazy. with when they go buy a motorcycle? Yeah, they have no idea. Yeah. I don't think they do. Like this um, guy's going to announce himself <laughs> shanking me. Uh, so let's let's take it from the beginning. Uh, college, yeah. underage bouncer, helping people <laughs> open bars, right. dumb luck into announcing. Mm -hmm. um, then I get out here, and I'm not lost, but I need something. So mm -hmm. I find this bar group uh, through a family member who had helped the owner buy these places and I'm working for him and I was there for about four and a half years. Okay. It was fine. Um, doing bar stuff, doing bar stuff. I was running one of his bars for him. He had two at the time, bought three right before the third one, right before the pandemic. Um, man, I tell you, it, it was, I was done with it. Mm -hmm. I was done. It was 2019 and I walked in to, um, Grand Prix motorsports. Okay. And, uh, I was just going in to get a jacket. I had just gotten my first like full size bike. And I say full size because the first bike I had was a 81 Midnight Maxim. I mm. could keep that thing going for about 150 miles. Right. And I had to put it into service for somebody to fix. Mm. I bought it for 900 bucks, put about four grand into it. Oh, wow. I was like, I'm cutting ties. Yeah. So I just bought my first BMW and I still have it now as well. And uh, I needed a jacket. I needed something to feel protected. So I walk in. And the guys there had actually been coming into the bar, and they I knew them oh, okay. yeah. from coming in. And uh, one of the guys, the sales manager, asked you know where I'd been for the last week because they had come in twice and they didn't see me. And I was like, ah, we you know, I parted ways and didn't mm -hmm. go into detail. But I'm, I'm getting my jacket, right? And I'm coming down the stairs. And uh, the GM there looked at me. He's like, 
hey, I heard you're going to be our new sales guy. Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> sure. In my head, again, I'm like, I don't know what just happened. Yeah. So I walk down and the sales manager is just smiling at me like, <laughs> I saw that. I'm like, man, what did you get me into? Tell me what's going on here. So mm-hmm. we talk. It takes him about 10 minutes to convince me to do it. So in my head, it's March 19, right? In my head, I'm like, you know what? It'll be a summer thing. It'll just get me through and it'll give me time to get, you know, the right bar group to go back into and help them run it. One thing leads to another and I turned to the CEO and I was like, I want to do more. I really enjoy this company. I want more. And uh, I knew that the marketing position was coming up. Mm -hmm. So I told her I wanted to do that for Grand Prix. And she didn't miss a beat, looked me dead in the eye and said, no, you don't. Oh, pretty sure I do because I just told you. (laughs) Right, right. Um, Turns out she had had a different idea for me. Mm -hmm. And that was a internet sales manager with backup finance. Um, I think you can tell by my past, finance and sitting in an office was not a great fit for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will openly admit and I will own it. I was not good at it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. Uh, The internet side was fine. That was great because I was still helping people and I was still moving them into the motorcycle world or in this case, motorcycle and or off-road world. We sold the side-by-sides and everything. And that's actually where Chance was. Okay. So uh, Chance sold me my first helmet and my first jacket. So now wild. And here you are. Now here we are working (laughs) with each other. But, um, in that, it just sort of made me fall in love with this company even more. Um, mm-hmm. You know, everybody's going to talk about um, uh, this company's the best for this reason or this company's the best for that reason. Not to sound any way, but I don't care. I know what Big Iron has brought me and the opportunities they've given me. And like I said, selling bikes was supposed to be a summer job. Yeah. Like I was back in high school, right? Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, they actually, in January, of the, that was in um, August, and I did September through the end of January, or the end of December of 19, and the uh, the head of marketing in, at the time and the GM at Grand Prix came into my office, like, and I knew, two people coming in, you know yeah, what's about to happen. Yeah. I was like, before you say anything, can I just go back to sales? I don't <laughs> like this. I'm not good at it. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, we were going to give you that option anyway. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. No, I, I really did enjoy it. And uh, about a month later, I asked if I could transfer. Mm-hmm. Um, so Grand Prix is Indian, um, Polaris. And I mean, right now they've got, I think, like eight brands they sell. Mm-hmm. But those were the main things, Indian and Polaris, which is the same company ostensibly. Um, I wasn't feeling the Indian. Okay. I, I, it didn't grab me. And in that meantime, I'd actually picked up my first Harley, my only Harley, but um, asked to transfer to our Mile High Aurora store. So in case you don't know, there are four stores in our company. Okay. Uh, Mile High Aurora and Parker and uh, Grand Prix and then us, Foothills BMW. Because uh, Grand Prix is like everything. This is obviously BMW Triumph. And then you get, they have a Harley. Two Harley stores. Two right? Harley stores. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, I asked to transfer there. They say, eh, you got to have to talk to them, go mm. through all that rigmarole. Um, I went and interviewed, not interviewed, just talked to the GM. We clicked instantly. Okay. Um, he said, yeah, come on. He explained how they'd work there and went right into it and didn't look back. Um, I'd give Chance a hard time every once in a while about selling off-road toys as opposed to real motorcycles, but uh-huh. it was just, it was all in, in fun jest and, right. you know, it's all friends and family. So... I did that for two years. Um, mm-hmm. That was right at, right before the pandemic hit, too. Okay. So I started in, like, mid-February, mm. mid-March. The world shut down. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what the hell did I do? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, this has got to be more stable than the restaurant industry right now. <laughs> so. Yeah, man, you've been putting up tents outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was it. So we were just, you know, plugging along. I took about a month and a half off. Let me rephrase that. I didn't take a month and a half off. Right, I right. was given a month and a half yeah. off, came back, and never looked back. It was a great time. Um, <laughs> that November, though, the day before Thanksgiving, I got into my first accident. Mm. And uh, I was just out doing a test ride. A brand-new bike had just been built. We have to test ride them after they're built. And uh, new tires, 
we'd had a really rainy November. Mm -hmm. Water was coming down at an intersection, was draining at an intersection. New tires mixed with cold concrete, mixed with water. It was a bad combo. Uh, yeah. I high sided, Ooh. skidded across the top of my head, thank God for helmets, and broke my shoulder. Oh, or, I'm sorry, separated my shoulder and broke my collarbone. Damn. And I was out for two months. I'm like, man, maybe this, maybe this industry isn't for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't, like, what am I doing here? Um, Collarbones are tough. Had to have surgery on that one. Oh, yeah. Like, like really, when it, really when it broke. broke um, th it was COVID. So the only way they were going to fix it that day was if it had come through the skin because mm -hmm. then it was an open wound with infection. Um, that was a Wednesday. My surgery wasn't until the next Wednesday. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a rough week, I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, but it did make me consider leaving the industry. And, um, you know, for anybody with big iron listening to this, I apologize for this next part. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> in that time frame, I was offered three different jobs outside of the industry, and I was heavily leaning towards it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have a lot of downtime, you start to question things. Mm -hmm. And I was questioning whether this was the route I was supposed to take. Um, a lot had happened to me personally in that mm -hmm. time frame as well. Um, and I just wasn't sure, but I came back and, you know, I was a little down because I, nobody from big iron had reached out to me, but at the same time, later on, I found out why that was. And it was some false information given to people by a former employee who had left in the meantime of me being mm. out. Um, and that was actually one of the people who reached out to me uh -huh. and didn't realize he was sort of sowing the seeds of dissent um, in the company right before he left and was trying to get me to go with him. But, um, yeah, when I came back, it, I just fell back into place. And yeah. everything was like, I don't like to look at it as family because it's not family. It's a really strong team. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just fell back in. It took a little bit to get the new new models. But, you know, once I did, it was just full steam ahead. And I, I loved it. And it, it brought that passion for the motorcycle world back to me. I think, um, I don't think you should have to apologize. I think, I know, I, I, uh, I got some really good advice years back. And it was, you know, in relation to working for whoever you're working for. And the advice was this, like once a year, you should apply for a new job. And it's not because you're not loyal to the place, but it's because if you stay, you've decided to stay. You've made a conscious decision to stay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's and I think that, that there's value in that. And, and I think, you know, if you were going to say, hey, you know, I applied at whatever the place is. And, uh, uh, you know, because people are always looking for opportunities, I think. And I think there's value in that. Like, hey, man, go apply. Because if you decide to stay, that means we're doing a good thing for you here. Mm -hmm. You enjoy being here. And, uh, you know, that, there's different ways to look at that. But I, I do think that sometimes people think, oh, if you're looking for outside work, then you're not being loyal. It's like, I don't know, man. Like you said, this is not a family. This is a business transaction. Mm -hmm. And we can have a good team, but I'm not a volunteer. Yeah. I'm not a 5013C, right? Or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it's my, I got that whole family team thing from my CEO. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know if she, came up with it on our own yes our our ceo yeah. for a huge motorcycle company or mm -hmm. retail retail company is a woman yeah and that's not something you see in the industry a lot does like. she ride oh she rides better than most people let's in this go company. all right she gets it um man she's just she's the coolest i was yeah. afraid of her at first not afraid i was intimidated by her at first um but man she's just one of the coolest people i've ever had the opportunity to work with um but she said it in one of our meetings she said, let's be honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is not a family. A family takes care of their weak and pulls mm -hmm. them up. We're a team. What happens to the weak link in a team? You get rid of it and bring somebody else who's going to bolster it up. Yeah. It may sound cold and heartless, but that's exactly what we are. We're, like Chance said, um, I don't know if this is going to come out before mine, but um, <laughs> if it doesn't, you'll get it afterwards. <laughs> we're a business. We're, we're a for-profit yeah. business, man. Yeah. You know, we, we are not here as a, as a charity. Yeah, <laughs> As a exactly. 501c3. Um, we're here to make money. It's mm -hmm. what everybody is in business for. You have to have the team around you. You have to have, and in my aspect as the sales manager, I have to have that strong sales team with me. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we hire the wrong ones. Sometimes we make the trade for the wrong ones. You know what I'm saying? If we're putting it in a sports analogy. Um, but in that, we learn. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually can tell, you know what, maybe they didn't fit there, but we can pull them in and we can train them up or we'll put them in another department where they might thrive. And that's happened. I've seen it at all of the dealerships I've been with. And again, I mean, I've worked for all of our brands. 
I've seen it happen. I know it can happen. You can train up, you can train out. It doesn't matter either way. Because if you're training them out, maybe they'll take those skills that they got with us on my sales team, mm-hmm. and they can flourish somewhere else. Who knows? I think you say weak link, and I, it's perfect because I think it goes a couple ways. First of all, can you coach them? Can you get them to where they need to be? But if it's – there's a timeline in there. But were they a bad hire? Were they a desperate hire? And it's like this person was never going to work out anyway. Yep. And you're right, for-profit business, are you dragging me down? And, and I'll openly admit, I've, I've made some bad hires mm-hmm. in, in my uh, time here with Big Iron and Foothills and of in the bar industry when I was there yeah. and running places. I've made bad hires. If you haven't, you're lying to yourself. Mm-hmm. But it is that thing. Can I coach them up? What is it that I saw in this person that I wanted them to be on my sales team? Can I bring them up? Was it a mistake? Can I find a better fit for them if it was? Mm-hmm. What makes a good salesman? So um, I did an interview with Brooke Reams. So I want to target the word good. And he said, uh, he was talking about challenging things. And he was like, you know, one plus one equals two. But only if we agree on what one plus equals means, right? Uh, And the example he gave was like, if you take one drop of water and you put it on another drop of water, it's still one drop of water. So Mm -hmm. one plus one equals one in that scenario. I say all that weirdness to say, what makes a good salesman? Only if we can agree on what good is right? What is good? And then what makes that person successful? Is it just, I sell 10 bikes a week or is it my customer base loves me and maybe I sell a little less, but man, I bring people into this dealership. Uh, If you had that, if you put an ad out that was completely honest and Mm -hmm. authentic, this is what we want and not the LinkedIn bullshit. Like politically correct. (laughs) It has to say this or it's not going to get promoted. When you hire that person, you're like, this is it. This is it. Right. So <laughs> coming, coming to, um, I'll be brand specific with this one. Coming from Harley to BMW, I had to, I don't want to say change, but tweak my personality a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, I couldn't be as forward. I couldn't be as direct with this clientele as I could be with, um, with Harley. Buyers. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, I want to dig into that too. So different well, clientele. It's an entirely different clientele base. And you know, is there some crossover? Yeah, there is. But in general, let's be honest, we always sell, we can't, you know, the generalizations don't work, but they're there for a reason. Uh, but we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. Yes. So I had to tweak my style a little bit, which also means I had to change the way I spoke to people. Mm-hmm. Um, different settings, anybody can do it but I, I made a conscious effort to it. And I was reminded a few times, I'm like, hey, you got to be a little softer with these guys. Yeah. And that's yeah. okay. Um, so if you were to cut all that bullshit out yeah. and just actually speak how you are, or in this case, how I am, I'm going to tell somebody this. You have to love motorcycles, period. Yep. Maybe you don't have one, but that's what you're you're working towards. That's your goal. Mm-hmm. Maybe, it's, maybe it's somebody guy or girl, I don't care, who has that endorsement, but they haven't had the means to get the actual bike yet. Cool. You want it. You're there. You're taking those small steps. You want to be here. Mm -hmm. That's first step. If you don't like motorcycles, you just think you can come in and sell something because it'll make you money, I don't want you. It's Mm -hmm. not a question. Next up, you have to be responsible. Like, I don't mean like, uh, oh, I can do this and I pay all my bills on time. Like all those things come into it, but you have to be responsible. These things are rockets. One of them literally is a rocket, (laughs) but that's the name of it. But think about it. Mm -hmm. These are machines where you have an engine right underneath your body. Yeah. You have nothing around you to protect you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to send someone who's irresponsible out on a motorcycle to give a test ride to a presumptive client and put themselves or the client in danger. Right. Now, I'm not saying put the client in danger like they're riding with them, but that client is typically going to ride how the sales consultant rides. Mm -hmm. You have to be responsible. You have to be knowledgeable of what these things can do and where your client is. Like when I was on the sales floor um, only, I would always ask my clients, how do you ride? All right. And I'm not asking, hey, are you reckless? Do you want to speed? Do you just want to go straight? No. No. I want to know. Are you comfortable on the highway? Are you only going to be a street rider? Are mm-hmm. you going to be, 
you know, going out I and mean, we're not taking, we're not taking riders out on dirt, right. you know, during right. a, a, a test ride, but I want to know about you, mm-hmm. you know, and, and quite honestly, when I was in sales, if, if I don't know those answers already before I answer the question or before I ask the question, I haven't done my job. I haven't, I haven't delved deep enough into that client to know what that answer is going to be. Mm-hmm. So when I say that, I mean, there's different steps. You have a conversation with these people before you just get into it. Hey, what bike do you want to buy? Oh, okay. I'm going to go because I don't know anything about that bike. Get to know the person. You have to be willing to do that. And that ties in here in a minute. Yeah. You have to get to know those people so you know what they're riding. Is it, um, is it a new rider who thinks they can take a K1600 and just, you know, go anywhere? You want to go off-road? Cool. No. Do a little bit of research on the bike. Do a little bit of research face-to-face with that person. Mm-hmm. You know, they may have an idea in mind of what, bike, what a bike looks like and what they want to do, and those two things may not come together at all, mm-hmm. you know, but at the same time, Maybe they have done their research. They may very well know more than my sales consultants do. And that's okay as well. You have to make that connection with them. And that's why, like when I said, you know the answers before you ask the question, mm-hmm. it's, just, it's just solidifying what you already know and what they've already told you. Okay, You're, You've made that connection with people. So that's another step. That's what I was saying. You have to be able to connect with people to mm-hmm. be a good salesperson. Uh, if you can't make that connection, what are you doing? What are you doing? And that's not to say that I've made a connection with every single person I've talked to in a dealership. Mm-hmm. There are times where I've stopped. Like, listen, there's something we're missing here, and that's okay. I got a guy who's going to be much better for you. Mm. Let me go and grab him. I'll fill him in as to where we're at, and he'll go from there. I, I think it'll just work better for you. Yeah. So tell me, Phil. We're not clicking. Let me grab my guy, Greg. He actually rides what you're looking for. I think you guys will be a little bit better fit. That goes so far into my personal philosophy on, and what sales is that it throws people off. They think coming into a dealership that they're going to get screwed over. Mm-hmm. You take something like that. They're coming in with their defenses up, right? Yep, yep. You take something like that and you acknowledge that this isn't working, but I got somebody for you. What happens to those walls? Yeah, like yeah. Jericho, they come tumbling down. All right, that is what it is. Like if you can't, if you can't see beyond yourself to help that client, get out. I don't want you. And again, people seeing this might look at it and not agree with me. And I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you agree with me on that one because I know it's right. We're a very straightforward and very transparent dealership group. I've seen it at all of our dealerships. It's fine. Pass them on to somebody. Help them. Get what they want. I mean, dude, it's motorcycles. Mm-hmm. This shit's supposed to be fun. Yeah. Right? It's not supposed to be um, a hard process. We like to make it as easy as possible to buy a bike. Um, just get them, get them to where they need to be. Mm-hmm. That's all it takes. I think you're going to have people that no matter what you get them to, like you said, that veil of skepticism, uh, you could say, hey, well, I'm going to knock $10,000 off this motorcycle for you. And they're like, you trying to trick me? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, uh, you know, and that's probably the few and far between, but, or maybe it's not. It, um, it's funny. You should bring up 10,000 because there's a bike just sitting right behind you. Um, mm-hmm. that has a green tag on it that I basically took 10 grand off of on Saturday and the guy didn't buy it. Um, he bought a pre-owned version of that same bike. So oh. it just worked for him better. Whatever. Let me ask you this then. So I've heard this, uh, because I thought you were about to say it, and I was going to go go in deep on you. Yeah, yeah. But I've heard this um, purchasing automobiles. I heard this purchasing an ATV. I've heard uh, salesmen or sales managers say, uh, I'm going to do this thing. I'm not making any money on this deal. To my thought is, or to my thought, my thoughts about that are, if you're not making any money on this deal, what the fuck are you selling me this for? Or are you just BSing me? You know what I mean? Or, or, or is our definition of making money not the same? I'm going to cover all those. Okay. So first and foremost, um, I'm not going to say it unless it's true. Okay. Period. And I'll back it up too. Mm-hmm. Um, the programs that we use, I can, I can see margin on every 
deal. Right. Like, um, and I'm not, I'm not telling industry secrets. Anybody, I mean, there has to be certain access levels. I'm like, I'm not going to give all my sales guys like access to know every number right. because I want them to still sell the bike. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to give it away all the time. Um, so I have like full access. Anybody in my position is going to have full access yeah. to everything that the system has to offer. Um, I can see my margins. I can see where I need to be. I have I have numbers where I want to keep them. Mm-hmm. Um, what it really comes down to is if you're not a dick, you'll probably get the deal you're looking for. Mm. Don't come in and just try to. You're talking about the customer. The, yeah. Okay. Don't come in and just try to badger. Right. My people, like mm-hmm. we're humans too. Like yeah. those people who come in and have that chip on their shoulder and just want to push and push and push. Those are the people that no matter how good the deal is, they're going to be unhappy. Mm. Okay. Yep. There's some people in, in every walk of life, there's some people who are just not going to let themselves be fulfilled and happy. Mm-hmm. They always have something to prove. You have nothing to prove in here. You came in here because you want a motorcycle. You came in here. Maybe you've never owned a BMW or a Triumph or even a Royal Enfield, but something about them grabbed your attention and you came in to see us, to see this. Now, there are those people who just come in and like, I just wanted to see these. I love mm-hmm. them. I mm-hmm. don't ride. I just like them. Cool. I have <laughs> things like that in my life. I have a wall full of guitars that I don't play. I yeah. just love the art behind them. Yeah. I've taken lessons, but I'm not good. I don't care. I love the art of them. There are some people, weird, but there are collectors of motorcycles who have never ridden a motorcycle. Yeah, I believe it. It's very strange and I don't get it, but I'm sure there's people who wouldn't understand why I collect guitars, but don't play them Mm -hmm. because I can't figure it out. It's fine. Who cares? I wanted to as a kid. It was a dream. Never happened. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 yes, there are always deals to be made. And why would I sell you that bike if I wasn't making money on it? When I say that to people and not in those words, but just sort of a generic Mm -hmm. version of that, I can flip that screen around and I can show them right there. Oh, a little there's transparency. A there's ch- again. I don't know if this is going to be before or after chance. No, but yeah. chance said, you know, we are a very transparent dealership, and you know, I'm not doing that with every deal, obviously. But when I have those kind of, kind of conversations with people, boom, zeros. It's right there. I'm not making money. <sighs> Sometimes there's people who are not happy unless it's a negative sign right there. I'm like, just come on, man. Like, I can't pay you to take the bike. <laughs> so, <laughs> so but, in that in that oh, aspect, oh, then maybe I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. When we talked about Ch- chance was like, yeah, there's very slim margins on these bikes, mm-hmm. but but, and if I if I and I don't want to speak for you, but if if I I don't say take a loss, but if it, the margin's the slimmest it can be, but we got the parts dealership, we got the service, like we know we're gonna get something. That's where I was going with it. Yeah, see, same page. Here so here's the thing: Why would I sell you something if I'm not making a profit on it? Mm-hmm. If we've been clicking, but numbers can't quite get there. Yeah. We've been having a great conversation because it is more than just buying a bike. If you don't click with your sales consultant, if you don't click, if it even gets to me directly where we're talking, if you don't click Mm -hmm. with me, if you don't click, if everything doesn't feel good, why would you buy it anyway? Yeah. So if I can get you a deal where it's basically my cost, Mm -hmm. okay, I can get you a deal, my cost, that's it. What's that going to tell you? That yeah, that you're putting you're actually doing the best thing you can for me in the position you're in. Exactly, I'm putting you ahead of the profit. Yeah. Now I'm not going to do that with everything. Mm-hmm. I can't afford to do that again, for profit. Yeah. But what I've done there is I've started a relationship. Okay. You and I now have that connection. You know I'm not going to try to screw you over. I've mm-hmm. already proven that. Now, is it solidified? No, but it's a really damn good first step. So now. I'm going to have my guys take you over to my service department. I'm going to have them talk to my parts guys. You know, what do you need? What's going to make this bike better for you? We mm-hmm. already know that's the right bike for you. Let's make it yours, mm-hmm. right? Here's your service schedule. Get it in as soon as possible. Summer's coming. Everybody's going to want to. I've already set that level of trust. You know that not everybody's trying to screw you over in the vehicle sales world, mm-hmm. all right? <laughs> I mean... It may not make sense to people, but that's really what we're about here. We want people on motorcycles. We want people specifically on our motorcycles. Absolutely. So why wouldn't we make it as easy as possible? Mm-hmm. Now, there have been some customers who have just just beat us up over bikes, get the deal they want, then they come back, 
and they do it again and again and again. Eventually what that does, because you always have us bending over and we just don't want to do business with you anymore. Right. And there's an, there's this, um, there's this saying you can replace the bike easier than you can replace a customer. Yeah, sometimes, mm-hmm. um, I don't have the same mindset as a lot of people who have been in this industry their entire lives. I've done a lot of different things. Sometimes you just have to cut that cord. Much like telling someone that, you know, we're not clicking. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll get a different sales consultant for you. Maybe we don't click with you as a dealership. Yeah. I know you've already purchased purchased at this other dealership in the south end of the city. They seem to love giving you the deal where they lose money all the time. (laughs) Gone ahead. Yeah. Go take all their money, but we're going to be done. We're going to be done. And this happened twice. I mean, Mm. obviously, I'm not going to. Yeah. put names on any of that thing but so i'm gonna ask you a yes or no question okay and i will let you obviously i will let you but <laughs> give you the opportunity to you know justify your answer but i want to make this a yes or no question because otherwise i think you'll do the other thing first okay <laughs> okay okay yes or no got me nervous yes or no the customer's always right no why is that the customer is not always right i'll go back to this and i'll make it we all want to believe that Mm -hmm. we really do. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself when I'm on the consumer side of things. Yeah. Like, well, this is what I want. Why can't you do it? Well, take a step back, take a step back. Think about it from whatever industry you're in. If Mm -hmm. you're in here, are your customers always right? Are the people that do business with you always right? No. If you want to go and actually have a race bike and drag knees across the track and do all this, but you want to do it on, let's see, what is that, Kimberly? On that R1250 right there. <laughs> right. Stop. Can you do it? Yeah. Is it right for it? No. Will it probably wreck your body? Yeah. It's not what it's designed for. Mm-hmm. You're not right. Let me get you on something that is right. And if you're going to get mad at me for directing you to something that's better for what you ultimately want to do, I'm sorry. Mm. I would much rather know that, you know what? I came in looking for this. I was shown that I was wrong, but I was shown what was right. Mm -hmm. They actually care. Again, they care more about me and getting what I want than just selling me something. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there other examples? Yeah, but no, the customer is not always right. If the customer are always right, wouldn't that mean we're, everyone was always right about everything they had to say in every aspect of their life. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, we're all consumers, we're all providers. Yeah. We're not always right. We need, (laughs) I don't mean for this to go any deeper than motorcycle sales right now. Okay. We need to get over ourselves. Yeah. We need to get out of our own way. I agree. And understand that we're we're not right all the time. Just because it's our opinion doesn't mean it's correct. Mm -hmm. It means it's our opinion. Even an informed opinion might be... uh not correct in some instances. Yeah. In certain aspects of whatever have formed that opinion mm-hmm. for you, you could be getting false information. And as soon as you get that information of that correct information, like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because can you race that bike? Yeah. Against other bikes built like that, not on a track with hairpin turns. Right. Right. Long distance cross country race. I'm not saying do a cannonball run on it. <laughs> I'm just saying that, yeah, you can race anything. Mm hmm. But that's not for being on a track and dragging knees around corners. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. So, could you do, could you put a professional racer on it? And they, yes, but also, I, I mean, I guess the opposite could be true. Could you ride a double R on a on the Dakar Rally? It probably wouldn't do too well. I mean, <laughs> you could do anything once. So. <laughs> I like to say that you can always do anything once. Well, it's like those videos yeah. where you see guys on like the old Gold Wings going over like backyard motocross courses, right? Like. But, that's a big old bike to land on you. You hit that whoop section. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to hurt. But, so, you know, can you? Yeah. Should you? Yeah. No. It's interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask this earlier, and we kind of pushed it off. And then I don't th- I don't know if these mics will pick that up. We've got some noise gates in place. But I just heard a huge you know, Harley go by brrr, mm-hmm. down the road. What's the main difference between those that group of customers and, say, the customers that come into a BMW Triumph dealer? Okay. So I'm speaking of this, having worked in both yes. dealerships, with both brands, with both everything. And I'll add this layer to it. I own both. Okay. Okay. 
I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm just trying to say this in the just nicest way possible. Just trying to save possible. my job. But <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, I was I was very sh- shocked when I came from Harley to BMW my first week. I had I had clients who were coming up to me not knowing me from Adam and like these are people who talk to everybody in the dealership like they know people. Mm-hmm. They see that I'm the new guy here. Um, whether they assume that I'm new to the industry or just new to the location, I don't know. I didn't delve into that. One of the first questions I got was, what do you think of the new cam angle on the K16? And I looked him dead in his eye and said, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care about it. Yeah. I really don't because I, I genuinely don't. Yeah. There are so many different types of riders that when I was selling, like on the sales floor selling, mm-hmm. you have different types of riders and you have different types of salespeople. There are the tech people and there are the emotional people. I am 100% the emotional side. I don't care what makes it run, do what it does. Mm -hmm. I care about that feeling I get. I care about that look, and this is going to be weird, but think about it. When you're sitting on a bike and if you've been in a dealership and you sit on a bike that you don't own yet, but you're considering it, and you glance down and you catch yourself in that mirror, Mm -hmm. you're like, fuck, that's cool. All right, all right, and it's just adding to that. This is the bike I want. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Or if you're a new rider and you're overwhelmed with it, no new rider is going to come in and be like, "Well, um, what's the camshaft angle? What's the um, what's the what's the optimal tire pressure?" Stop, right. stop. And if they do, that's because they read on a forum of questions you're supposed to ask. Yeah. Forums are the worst place to get information yeah. because all it is is a bunch of people giving their opinions and yeah. looking for an argument. Mm-hmm. Go to the website for the manufacturer. Read up on the bike a little bit. Don't overdo it because there's like this like thing where you, you it's a tipping point where you've just done too much research and now you have no idea what you want to do and now you're out of the motorcycle game entirely. Yeah, I think, um, on, yeah, it, just like well, when I rode that 1300, I didn't study up on the, the specs. I mean, I knew some stuff was different, mm-hmm. but I was like, how does this feel yeah. when I ride it? Like, do, am I smiling? Like, does it feel like it wants to corner? Uh, and and there are there are sp- there is space out there for very technical reviews. There is. What you feel right now is because we changed the swing arm angle by whatever. Like, I'm with you. Like, okay. Like, I'm not setting any lap records out here. No, that's and, not what I'm going for. And I'm probably um, accessing... 60% of what this bike can do on a good day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, right. <laughs> and that's an elite rider, unless you have a license to like actually like a racing right. license. Um, but just real quick, just to compare and contrast these yeah, two. Yeah. The Harley rider is that person that wants that. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Where If you watch these documentaries about people who ride and things like that, um, you want that feeling of Americana. You want that mm. just solid steel, you get on it and you feel its power. You know what you're getting into. You know you're going to buy a bike and then you're going to spend a third of the cost of that bike on making it your own. Yeah. Okay. And to a certain extent, Harley riders and Harley buyers are those people who want the badge. Mm. I want that badge. I want people to see I'm on Harley. I want people to ooh and ah over the changes I've made and the mods I've made to my bike. A BMW rider is, I don't want to say more educated, but they've educated themselves more on that specific bike that they want. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I keep going back to the K16 just because it's in, right in front of me. Yeah, it's, right uh, there. it's a beautiful bike. It's an inline six cylinder motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Inline, th- just think about it. Inline, inline six. six. Yeah. <laughs> it's like That's, car motor. When you start that thing up, this will, this will connect with the feel. Mm-hmm. When you start that thing up, it sounds like a supercar. And it's so fun. You're like, oh, well, this is it for me. Now, I'm not a K bike rider. I mm-hmm. have an R. I like the boxer engine. That's my jam. Yep. There's a different feel to that engine. BMW riders and Triumph riders are going to be a little bit more educated about the bike that they want specifically, um, whether that be the emotional side of it, whether it be the tech side of it, whether it be the gearing and the mechanical side of it. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Harley riders, and I'm, listen, it's generalized statements, but it's, I'm yeah. not saying it's every single Throw one. Throw a blanket over it. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's just a quick version of it. We don't have, Mm-hmm. 24 hours to do this they want the badge they want that feel they want that look i'm guilty of it i've got both i don't care it's not an offensive statement it just is mm-hmm. what it is i've wanted a harley since i was a kid 
And I finally got one, and I love it. And my, my boys give me a hard time. I'm like, it's a grandpa bike. I'm like, you don't ride, so you have no say. <laughs> um, I have my R1100 RT. It's an old one, and it is so fun. 84,000 miles on it, second owner. Love that thing. Mm. It's just that feel it gives you. There's a connection to it. It's there. Now, the BMW doesn't hurt since those are my initials as well. <laughs> so I always knew I was like, well, I'm bound to have one sometime. Yeah. So That K bike's pretty cool, by the way. But they're pretty cool. I think, uh, I don't know. I've never owned a Harley, and I, and I like how we're breaking this down and, and kind of feel. And there's different things that people appreciate about a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, the thing that struck me about Harleys, and so I've never owned a Harley. I did take a cross-country trip on a Cruiser, a 1600. That was awful, by the way. Um, so I do have some time in the saddle. Yep. The thing that that excites me about a motorcycle like that 1300 I rode or the bike I ride, um, or even the KLR that I had, it has like 39 horsepower or whatever. But that it was 650, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the ability to perform in the capacity that I want it to. Mm -hmm. And to me, just my own opinion, a Harley, I was like, it doesn't do anything like very well, like stat sheet well. Turn, corner, like it's heavy. But when I hear you explain it, it's like, but that's not, that's okay. That's not what I want it for. No. I want the badge. I want the field. I want the shaking under me. I want to pull up in a parking lot somewhere and like, dude, he's on that. That's a cool bike. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. maybe, and, and like I said, while I was talking to Chance, the GM about it, uh, threw that out for context in case you're <laughs> in Washington. But, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, maybe that's all I do. Maybe you do four poker runs a year and you do 100 miles every time and that's it. Cool. Cool. Maybe what, you're not riding it to Northern California and back. That's what makes you happy. Yeah. We have these, most people have these to make them happy. Yeah. Not to. It's your money. Yeah. <laughs> do, do what you want. I don't care. Yeah. Like, as long as you have something that gives you that feeling. Mm. And you know what? Maybe those tech guys, maybe they get that same feeling that we get from the emotional side of it when they know they have that same bike that we have, right? Yeah. Two different ways of looking at it. We get that feeling from just the everything about it that comes together. Mm -hmm. They get it knowing different millimeters and torque specs. Who who cares at the end of the day? Are yeah. you enjoying what you're doing? Yeah. That's all it's about. Yeah. And there's all <laughs> there's always somebody more, there's always somebody faster. There's always somebody with more knowledge. Yeah. So it's like does it make you just your money? You bought it. Does it make you happy? Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. I mean, even these guys who like these these old school guys with Harley and even even over in this brand mm. section of the industry as well. Some of these older guys, and it's hard for me to figure out which side I'm on because at 45, I still feel very young with it, but mm. I have people looking at me telling me I'm old. But uh, <laughs> they look at these guys and they're like, that's, uh, that's not a real bike because it's this, this, and this, and oh, that Harley has ABS on it. What's wrong with you? Like, oh, like I chose to have ABS on there. I don't care. I love ABS. I've used ABS. Oh, man. One bike has it. One bike doesn't. Yeah. M wish my Harley had ABS. Mm -hmm. um, and let it go. Mm -hmm. Like, I see these guys on trikes, and some people will mock them. What does it matter? It doesn't matter if somebody's on a trike. You don't know their story. Let them be. Yeah. Let them be. Do their thing. Pay attention to yourself and move on about it. I had a guy when we were at Mile High, we were doing Dyna Days, which, if you're in the Denver metro area or anywhere in Colorado, if you see Dyna Days, get there. It is a blast. Stunt shows, like vendor. Oh, it's so much fun. Uh, I would take a day off from here to go and oh, do wow. it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a yeah. blast. I heard guys talking about this guy coming in on a, uh, it's been so long since I'm with him. Um, KLR 650. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, he's coming in on a trike. Yeah. And um, guys were just sort of busting his balls like, this guy around the track, and he was a younger dude. Yeah. He was a younger dude, but he pulled up, and he parked. This man was missing both legs. Both I already knew. Man. I already knew where you are going. I mean, I don't know the guy, but I'm like. Yeah. I'm like, you, see, you don't know his story. But yeah. He's out there riding still. Mm -hmm. All right? He lost him riding. Oh, wow. He was and not going to give riding. it up. He had a wheelchair rack attachment on the back of his bike. Mm -hmm. He didn't ride with his legs on. His um, the prosthetics, his yeah. prosthetics on. Yeah, everything was moved to hand controls. Okay, who cares? He's out there riding, doing more work to ride a bike than any of us have. Yeah, that's he, wild, it man. Was crazy, but as soon as they saw that, you saw that look on their face, like, oh, hey, glad nobody else heard me. The guy that he didn't hear me say that. Yeah, you know, 
watching him swing his legs over the seat and put his uh, prosthetics on. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. All right, you're about it. So get out there and enjoy it. It doesn't matter. And to the new riders, the new riders are the most important for this industry, mm -hmm. period. Without it, it's going just into the ether. It's done. Don't let people tell you what you have to ride. Get out yeah. here. Do a little bit of research, like I said earlier. But, I mean, don't be crazy with it. I personally, personally, had I gotten the bikes I wanted when I was 17, 18 years old, up to about probably about 25, I wouldn't be here right now. Mm. I was not responsible enough. I know my GM Chance, his first bike was a sport bike. He's responsible. He was ridiculously responsible at a young age. Not for me. That's not where I was. Mm. So it's better for me is what it is. Yeah. So do a little bit of research and, and let let you be your own guide. Mm -hmm. Don't look at forums. So. Yeah, a lot of it's, I don't want to say misinformation, but you know, you just you know, you can't vet the information. And you might get uh, some really good data. You mm -hmm. might not get some good data. Um, yeah, you never know what you're going to get. I think if, if we want to wrap it up, I think the last thing I'll, I'll mention is um, there's a weird sort of, so we talk about new riders, mm -hmm. and I think they need to understand, or even the, the folks I'm about to talk about, there's a weird sort of gatekeeper vibe. I'm glad you brought that up. Especially in this industry. Trying to break into the industry through mapping and then podcasting. <laughs> but you talked about the difference in types of clientele mm -hmm. between BMW, Harley-Davidson, all that. Um, I would say, and I don't want to throw a blanket over everybody, but I've experienced almost a vibe of, and who are you to even try to do this? Who are you to even try to ride that motorcycle? Mm -hmm. Who are you to try to, like, well, we've been there before, or we're, we're more experienced, or we're in the industry. And, and again, I have had incredible conversations and relationships with, with folks that have given me an opportunity or that have been willing to come on the show. I'm talking bigger companies. Uh, the best example I can give you is when I was out uh, on the trail and I ran into a group of riders and uh, I just, it, it felt like kind of looking down their nose at me. And I was like, this is who I am, this is what I do. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Anyways, right? It's just a brush off. A brush off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very real thing, not just in the motorcycle industry, but in, in, in I, what I'm experiencing in this industry in particular is a little bit of that sometimes. And, uh, it's very interesting, and I know that you are closer to it than I am, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. So with my background, um, mm -hmm. I have a couple of different takes on that, and I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it this way. The first motorcycle I ever rode, I was three years old. Mm -hmm. It was one of those old uh, little 50 cc's with the, with the kill, kill rope on it like so it can't go too fast and <laughs> yeah. if you get out of control whoever's jogging behind you can pop it out and mm -hmm. kill that um that set my love for this industry at a very early age um not for the industry for motorcycle riding i didn't know yeah. it was an industry to me it was just my mom's friends who had dealerships back in illinois okay um i didn't ride i didn't even swing a leg over a bike for close to 20 years and uh, when I got back into it, it was in Chicago. And one of the guys at one of the bars I was at, um, we are both regulars, it wasn't working. He found a bike on eBay for 600 bucks. I'm like, that's cool. That reminds me of those bikes that the guys had back in the day. Mm -hmm. And it sparked my love of, um, of motorcycling again. I came out here. I didn't want to own one in Chicago. I didn't have a garage. <laughs> like, right, right, like, yeah, not optimal. I'm going to have it for three days, right? Right. Um, it's going to be stolen. So I didn't have one there. I got out here, had a garage, and, and I got a bike. And, you know, there were some people who looked at it and the same thing. That's what you're on. And, and this is what I could afford right now. Mm -hmm. And I had plans for it, very grandiose plans. Yeah. Like <laughs> I had mentioned it earlier, I'd spent $4,000 on a $900 bike. Um, had I been able to spend that 4000 and customizing it, I would have had so much fun. Yeah. I was just keeping it running. Um, getting into the industry, however, I felt there was gatekeeping mm -hmm. when I came into the industry to work in it. There were people who looked at me like, why are you here? Mm. Why are you doing this? You don't even ride this type of bike or you're not even the type of person we want in the industry with us. 
well, guess what? You don't have a fucking say in what happens in this industry. Right. You're a very small, small man to think that you have weight mm. in, an is- in an industry that is doing billions of dollars a year. Cool. You sell 200 units a year? Awesome. That's a drop in the bucket. Stop it. Your opinion might matter to people buying from you, but mm-hmm. it, they don't matter to people who are sure of themselves and know what they want. So I experienced it on that level. Yeah. Um, and it, and it kind of sucked. Not kind of, it did. Like, mm-hmm. I thought we were on the same team here. I thought it was supposed to be like, you know, you're going to help me out because I'm new. I'm going to, yeah. you know, I'm going to lean on you a little bit here. Um, but you're going to, you're going to set that up and you've been in doing this for 15 years. So now you're, you're, you're better. Well, you're better at it because I'm new, but you're not a better person because of it. Mm-hmm. So you need to stop. Uh, when I went to Harley, um, I already knew what I was doing, mm-hmm. but it was different things that people were looking at there. And uh, without delving into it, I think we all know what I'm saying. Um, you know, but then you have your those... background in theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's what they were looking at. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I like the way you did that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then we have people coming in with Harley, and they they come in and they think they. They know what they're talking about. I mean, I had a guy ask me about the new knucklehead. It was 2021, man. There's no new knucklehead. Stop talking. <laughs> He's like, I read about it. I said, damn forums again. Yeah. But there's gatekeeping because if you don't own the right kind of Harley or you don't own the right kind of accessories on the right kind of Harley, uh, your opinion and your professionalism and your knowledge that you have doesn't mean a damn thing. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. I know what I'm doing here. I've earned this position. I'm going to take what's mine that I've earned mm-hmm. and other people's opinion be damned. I'm going for it. No, not everybody's going to do that. Some people will take that pushback as, damn, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Mm-hmm. No, if that's what you love, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Stop. Stay with it. You'll be fine. But you'll also find those people, not to blow my own horn, but you'll find those people who will pull you away from that. And I'm one of those people. I'll pull you away from that. Those people are horrible to talk to. Come over here. Let's you and me figure this out. I'll help you get there. I'll help you thrive. Mm. I'll help you move forward in this industry if that's where you want. And even when I was in the bar industry, if this isn't what you're going to do for the rest of your life, but a good chunk of it right now, take the knowledge you gain and go. Mm -hmm. Run with it. Be successful elsewhere. But it's it's those older guys. It's those people who have been riding since 1974 and want to talk about how all Harleys leak or how all BMWs do this or all stop it. Mm -hmm. Stop it. You haven't ridden a bike in 20 years. You just told me that you hadn't bought a new bike in 30 years. You're you're talking out of your neck. Like, stop (laughs) it. Like you, you haven't done the research. You don't know what you're speaking on. Did they have issues back then? Yeah, they did, but everything did. Mm -hmm. Technology moves forward. Everything gets better. That's like saying, hey, if you start your car with a key instead of an engine crank, you're not really driving a car. Man, man, move on. Right. Move on. Better yet, if you're one of those old guys who wants to talk bad about, like, the new people who are riding and they're riding like a, they're going back to a Triumph or, like, that's not a real bike because it doesn't have this. Maybe you need to get out of your own way. Maybe you need to get out of all of our ways Mm. because you're not welcome anymore. It's not, it's not the same industry. And that's what keeps people away from writing mm-hmm. is those people who want to give themselves that gatekeeper title. And they'll never actually say they're a gatekeeper. Oh, it's just my opinion when they get called on it. Mm-hmm. Well, your opinion is terrifying someone who has never been into a dealership before. Stop it. You, I don't want to say you don't matter, but your opinion doesn't matter. If somebody just wants to ride a bike, you know what? It Harley. Somebody wants to ride a sportster because that's what appeals to them. Great. You know what? I'm six foot tall and 250 pounds. I love some of those sportsters. I look like a circus bear <laughs> on a tricycle. I know I can't right. ride those, right. but I love them. They're fun. Mm. They're nimble. You can throw them around. Who, who gives a damn? Let people do what they're going to do. You don't need to decide, or you don't get to decide who gets to do what in this industry. Yeah. Period. I think. It's perfect uh, to wrap it up on this. I was talking to my buddy who was on the on the show last week, and 
he summed it up. He's like, are, are you contributing to the hive? Like, are you contributing or are you taking away? Yeah. And I was thinking when you were talking, I'm like, the reason that we're sitting here with all this amazing equipment and cool cameras and great microphones and awesome audio is because there were people that didn't gatekeep and they put this information out <laughs> and I was able to learn. And so yeah. here we sit doing this stuff, the contributors, Yeah. right? And so when you have folks in the motorcycle industry or the community, I would say the motorcycle industry in general, you know, we are contributing to the hive right now because we're putting out information. Maybe there's some of entertaining or whatever. Um, but the folks that don't want other folks to enter that industry, you know, we need a new generation of riders. Mm -hmm. We need a new generation of people that are uh, excited about gigantic adventure bikes, right? And it's like, are you contributing to the hive or are you gatekeeping, trying to keep people out, yeah. right? And, and what is it you think you are gaining by keeping people out? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't understand people who do it to begin with. Yeah. You know, I, I think we've established, I've dabbled in a lot. Mm -hmm. I am by no means an expert in anything, but I know what I know. And if I can pass that information on to anyone. Yeah. A little bit self-serving because it's like, oh, I helped. I, I yeah. got to do that for them. But I passed it on to them. I made them a little bit more comfortable. Maybe it's somebody's first time coming through those doors. This can be intimidating. Imagine walking through a Harley dealership for the first time. Oh, man. I knew I was going in to talk to someone in my own company. I knew people there, and I was still intimidated when I walked into my first Harley dealership. I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Someone brand new to it, absolutely terrifying. Stop putting that old motorcycle um, stereotype in front of people. Mm -hmm. Get past ourselves. And once we do that, I think we'll really open up to that younger set. I don't want a little bike. I don't. Like, yeah. Sports are just different. I don't <laughs> want like a little 500. I don't want um, anything like that. But if somebody does, you know, mm -hmm. and if they do, damn it, I'm going to help them make sure they make the right decision. And if I can't, I'm going to get them with my guys and they'll make sure that they make that right decision and they're comfortable mm -hmm. more than anything. So get out of our own way, bring people into the fold. Yeah. And let's just have fun with this. This is, it's motorcycles. Nobody needs these. Nobody needs yeah. these until you have it. And then once it's in your blood, you have to have it. Yeah. Period. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think there's two ways to look at it. There's, uh, all you have to do is go to a gathering and you'll hear all the, the one-upsmanship. And, and there's a good way. There's a, there's a fun way to do it. Like, well, I've been riding 10 years. Well, I've been riding 20. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been riding 50. And it's like, you can take that and use it as a gate to keep people out. Like, how could you possibly know as much as me? Or, look, I've been doing this for a long time. Let me help you. What do you need to know? Yep. And I might not even know everything, but I will. I may just know my bike. Yeah. But if you have a question about it, damn it, I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have fun with it. Yep. So That's a great way to put it. I'm glad we ended on that because I think we acknowledge it and you kind of spin it like, well, this is going to be a positive or negative experience. Yep. And it's out there, man. It's, it is 100% out there. And I don't think... You can't change those folks. But what we can do is put our spin on things um, collectively as, as an organization, as a group, or as a community and say, I'm not going to change that. But what I can do is give you my best yeah. today. I'm not going to change them, but I'm damn sure not going to be them. Yes. Let's check about Let's Let's talk about this. Let's Maybe. see what you want to know. And you know what? Maybe they did a little bit more research than they even realized they did. And they're going to give you something you didn't know. Mm-hmm. It's a two-way street, man. Let it, just let it flow. And, you know, and not to go on a whole different tangent, but I see a lot of that with female riders, too. I mm. love women riders. I can't wait to get my daughter riding. Yeah. I was going to say seven. My wife said five. I was like, that, wait, what? Okay. Three. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It's guys coming into a dealership. It's intimidating. Women coming into a, a dealership oh, by themselves. I couldn't imagine what they have to go through. Mm -hmm. I love having women come in and, and getting them on a bike that maybe they didn't expect to like or didn't think they could control or didn't think this or didn't think that, and we get to show them, we get to bring them into the fold, oh, man. Yeah. Man, I just kick the gate down because there is no reason that everybody can't do what they love. I absolutely agree. I think the newer generation of riders, I think women riders, I think, you know, guys like us are, are going to buy motorcycles. That's established. Mm -hmm. What about the folks that are coming behind us? Yeah. How do we get them in the industry? How do we get them involved? How do we get them looking at stuff like, man, that looks amazing? How do we get that, maybe not technical vibe, but that smile? Yeah, twist I don't the care. throttle, I get the smile. Man, yeah. let's go. Even those tech writers, 
once it comes down to it and you hit that throttle, that's all that matters. Yeah. Like, you know what got that throttle to do that. We know what that throttle gives us. Yeah. Who cares? We're still going down the road. Sometimes one wheel, but mostly two. <laughs> so, Man. Yeah. Great episode, man. I, I This, uh, like, I love it because I touched on a couple things I wanted to, but everything else was just kind of ad hoc flow in it. And I, I really appreciate it's it. It's got to be sometimes. It's amazing. Uh, contributing to the hive, man. Man, you know, that's what we have to do. And uh, again, anybody listening to this who's who's made it all the way to the end, just get out and do it. Take a class if you've never ridden before. If it's been a few years, take a class, get a little brush up, but come and enjoy it. Come yeah. join us. I'm not even a group rider fan. I just love mm. to get out, but I love seeing people doing what they love to do. Yeah. And if I can help you, if my guys can help you, and not, not to be a sales pitch or anything, but I'm just saying like, go someplace you're comfortable. And if I can make you comfortable and my team can make you comfortable, come see us. Yeah. Even if you're just doing a little bit of research, what better place to do research than, than the place that has them? And it is. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. is yeah. You're looking at it right now. I'm saying. It's, Nobody's it, going to fault you for coming to sit on some stuff and kick some tires, I guess. I don't even work here, and I'm just saying. <laughs> no, we yeah. won't. If you've got questions, man, just let us know. Just let us know, yeah. and we'll be more than happy to help you out. Dude, well, thanks so much for being on the show. No, thank you for having me. I, I've never done one of these before. Um, great experience. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Really great experience. Absolutely. Everybody, Brendan Fraser. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, where's oh, I, got, I got the thing. <laughs> oh, there it is. There, there it is, it is. man. All right, good one.